Workplaces that support good mental health have never been more important. And it's not just about supporting individual or personal mental health. It's about the work environment, the design of work, the right people in the right roles, levels of autonomy, demands matching available resources, with opportunity for growth, as well as relationships and social connection. When you have all of this, it's incredibly protective of mental health. And in its absence, not only are those things are not only are those that bring personal mental health issues to the workplace more vulnerable, but it contributes to poorer mental health outcomes across the board. So in terms of who, who we are at BHP, we've got a global workforce of more than 80,000 people and for more than 130 years we've been producing the resources that have supported economic growth and made capital lives better around the world. Everything we produce, including iron ore, coal, petroleum, copper and nickel, helps to deliver these outcomes. But the production of resources is not in itself um, what this is about. It's the resources that enable the real difference, driving growth and development, underpinning materials, sanitation and healthcare, sustainable food production, developing industry, building vital infrastructure and allowing broad-based wealth creation. And as our purpose says, we exist to bring people and resources together to build a better world. People are at the heart of our values and supporting their mental health is absolutely company priority. However, mental health has not always been front of mind. Um, Ten years ago when I joined the company and apart from some localised ad hoc campaigns and most people having access to EAP, mental health was seen more as a personal issue and not something that required focus and prioritisation from a company perspective. In fact, when I commenced, um, I'd recently proposed a mental health strategy for my former company was keen to understand what mental health programs were in place at BHP. Recognising the lack of an overarching strategy, I enthusiastically proposed its development. However, there was little support. I soon realised that with such a short tenure in the company, I needed, time to, I needed to take the time to understand the current company priorities, deliver some results to establish my credibility, and over time, identify some leaders in the business that could support me in championing mental health as a priority before revisiting. It wasn't until several years later that conditions were right to revisit mental health as a company priority when I was approached by one of the business leaders following the tragic loss of one of our employees to suicide. This leader, long standing in the business and highly regarded, had also lost an uncle that died by suicide. He was very committed to understand what more we could be doing to better support the mental health of our employees. I had my champion. BHP back then was a large, more geographically and culturally diverse company than it is today, and levels of mental health awareness varied significantly. There was a need for many conversations involving myself and this business leader across many parts and levels of the organisation to raise awareness of this issue and the largely hidden impact it was having. Not surprisingly, Many people we engaged with spoke of family members or friends that had personally been impacted by a mental health issue, and so they could gain an understanding of why this could be important to the company. Now at that stage, very few at the time spoke of any personal mental health conditions themselves. Stigma was certainly right. Making the connection to the role of the workplace really was what the challenge was all about. So critical to successfully taking this forward was to demonstrate the alignment an ability to leverage existing programs and routines, and importantly, highlight that our support for a mentally healthy workforce would support an acceleration towards our desired inclusive culture of care. We obtained sponsorship from Group HSC's member of the Executive Leadership Committee to form a working group. And we identified representatives from all functions of the business, including human resources, health, safety, and environment, communications, and people leaders from across the globe. We also sought out individuals who were willing to share their lived experience of mental health to provide their insights, support breaking down stigma within our working group and provide feedback on direction. We decided to engage with external experts to find the most suitable framework for us to look to implement and selected the University of Newcastle who have done extensive engagement and research on the mining sector to work with. In the end, we adopted the blueprint for better mental health, focusing on the four pillars of culture, capacity, prevention and recovery. With the engagement and sponsorship that we've gained to form the working group, develop our framework, our next step was to seek the endorsement of the framework from our CEO and the executive leadership team. Although recognising the importance of all four pillars, 
our focus initially was very much on the culture space in raising awareness and reducing stigma. And in the recovery space, strengthening the services and accessibility of our employee assistance program. The risk we wanted to counter was raising awareness, encouraging people to recognise and respond to poor mental health, but then not have access to the supports they needed themselves. We established a global minimum standard for EAP that included a minimum six sessions for each specific issue of concern per year, and the ability to extend where needed. Access for immediate family members was ensured, and minimum provider qualifications were included in tenders. To break down stigma, we quickly realised the power of personal storytelling. This started with the inclusion of workers with lived experience of a mental health disorder, meeting with and talking to their experience with the Global Mental Health Working Group. In order to help break down stigma in the company, I needed to break down the stigma that I held myself. At the age of 26, and working as a medical registrar in a busy hospital, I developed a depressive illness with anxiety. Work became increasingly difficult for me. However, my self-stigma stopped me from ever talking of my experience, let alone seeking support. I ended up quitting my job, took some time out for a while, and then sought out a much lower stress role. I developed several subsequent depressive health events and did seek the professional support I needed, developed ongoing supporting routines, but never talked of my experience to anyone other than my wife. It was time to do so, and started talking of my personal experience to our working group, other leaders and teams. It was a real challenge to do so, and I remain uncomfortable still to this day, but also realise the importance of doing so. And with doing so, really became a degree of authenticity in my leadership that previously was missing. Our first global awareness campaign involved filming a number of people from across the globe, telling their personal stories on an experience of a mental health condition framed in hope and recovery, and this was very successful. This is, a, this is a pretty busy slide and getting the detail may be difficult and it will be sort of shared with you um, afterwards. But on the slide, which is now a number of years ago, that we developed a number of years ago, we set out what we thought at the time were the priorities for the business in terms of the various stages that you might go through in terms of implementation, um, the resources that were needed, and called out the types of behaviours we expect to see early in a business's mental health maturity and how those behaviours would ideally evolve over time. Our executive key performance indicators were tied to demonstrating progress up the maturity curve. If we were to have our time again, it's probably one key element that I would definitely change um, and, and prioritise earlier on in our journey. In the proactive phase, you can sort of see there's one called workplace mental health risks being identified and managed. Some of you may recognise this as workplace psychosocial risks and, and definitely this would receive a high level of prioritisation if I had my time again. Within BHP right now, the management of psychosocial risks are our highest priority, and I note that this is becoming a stronger focus from a regulatory perspective, at least from an Australian context. I thought I'd finish with sharing what I consider to be our, our key challenges and lessons. The first one is, is find your champions. Whether you're a standalone company or a multinational company, don't feel you need to tackle this on your own. Even if you have a team to support you, there will be people out there in the business with a passion for mental health and ability to connect and influence people that given the chance will be far more impactful in creating the case for a mentally healthy workplace than the very best business case. It takes a team. And when forming a team, involve one with a cross section of the workforce in terms of departments, levels and experience including those who may be somewhat sceptical read this topic. Diversity certainly helps. And where possible, look to include workers with a lived experience of a mental health condition to help break down that stigma and review and advise on your program elements. But it's okay to start small. And starting small can be as simple as starting a conversation. And a conversation can become a groundswell. And from there, you can start to be more ambitious. Changing culture starts with me. Leaders shape culture and culture drives performance. All of us here are leaders, whether that is recognising your title or through your passion and commitment to better mental health. I, for a while, was talking the talk about the importance of stigma reduction and looking to others to lead the way. As uncomfortable as I was, I needed to lead and lead into these conversations. You may not personally have experienced the mental health condition, but every one of you will have experienced the impact of someone who does. 
what will be your authentic experience that you will share. Although globally we all share a common experience of mental illness, our cultures in which these illnesses occur and the language used to describe these experiences are different. Our global approach has been too Australian centric. In Australia, there are high levels of awareness for a number of years of excellent public health programs. Chile is quite different. There is much lower mental health literacy, stigma is higher, the culture is very different, and we have not been as impactful. However, that is now starting to change with greater localization of approach and increased leadership awareness. Finally, it is where I started that I will finish. The importance of good work. Good work that is inclusive, where demands are matched with the resources, there is decision-making latitude, supportive leaders and teammates with the ability to connect, to develop and to grow. This is incredibly protective and provides a buffer for those individuals that are experiencing a mental illness. Every company must have a good work component for the mental health action plan. Thank you. Hi everybody, so my name is Tim Munden. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at Unilever and also I lead on employee wellbeing. Unilever is a purpose-driven business. Our purpose is to make sustainable living commonplace. That purpose um, is also based and anchored in three beliefs, that brands with purpose grow, that companies with purpose last, and that people with purpose thrive. Our strategy, some of the key strategic choices that we've made include um, as you'll see in the second choice, improving people's health, confidence and well-being through our brands, um, through how we serve our consumers every day. We also are a business based on a clear multi-stakeholder model, a commitment to a multi-stakeholder model. Uh, and of course, included in that um, are our people. So if you take those three anchor points, a purpose-driven com company, um, around making sustainable living commonplace, one that's committed to improving people's health and well-being, and that has clearly identified our people as one of our many stakeholders, then the fact that we are very, very focused on our own people's health and well-being, and in particular their mental health and well-being, is not a surprise. It's an inherent part of who we are as a business. So how have we gone about building our approach to supporting mental health in the workplace? We evolved um, a planning process, a way of thinking about mental health very early on, which we built in our UK business to begin with, but then we've scaled globally. And basically what that focuses on is four things. That we're seeking to address culture. So that's about stigma, about making sure we place mental health on a par with physical health. We're trying to really build leadership capability so that's about the awareness and knowledge on mental health, but also, as Rob's talked about, encouraging role modeling. And this is leadership at all levels, senior leaders, but also the critical role of line managers. We're focused on prevention. How can we help people to have good mental health? How can we prevent the experience of poor mental health where that's possible? How can we build resilience? And lastly, support. How do we give support to people when they start to struggle with their mental health? How do we do that? We do that through enablement through global tools. We do it through communications campaigns. And more recently, we've been doing it through enabling the Unilever community to take care of each other. We have 149,000 people around the world. Um, and I think one of the big insights we've had over recent years is how powerful it is when we equip the community itself. So what are the kinds of things that we do um, in this four box model? We create ongoing podcasts and events um, and that this is about how you really keep the message current, keep people thinking about it. But there are also critical moments that matter. And we're experiencing some at the moment. COVID's created a lot of moments that matter for mental health. So for example, in some countries, people who've been working at home are returning to workplaces. In other places, people are continuing to work at home who used to work in offices. But we've had tens of thousands of people who've stayed in their workplaces because what they're doing is critical. For example, in manufacturing of products for cleaning homes and cleaning, cleaning hands. And we've needed to have people continuing to work in those factories. So, but the, all of those situations create a moment that matter that we can enable with good content, good training, good awareness to be an impactful moment around mental health. 
What do we do in leadership? We've done a lot in this area. So classic line management training and capability building, but also trying to, to look after line managers, support line managers across the whole range of environments that we have. In. We have line managers managing people in the field, in sales. We have line managers in factories, in research labs, as well as in our offices. So helping those line managers in the environment that they're in, but also equipping line managers with tools that they can use. I'm going to show you one of those later tools that they can use to easily start conversations or to spot signs on mental health. On prevention, there's quite a number of things. So we've trained a cohort of mental health champions. I'm going to come back to that later. Um, and, and that equipping of the community has been very powerful. Team energy assessments um, is, a, I have to say, one of the things that the team has created that I, I am most uh, impressed by and proud of. The team energy assessment was built with an external partner. Um, it's a completely anonymous survey that an individual can do. They get a report back. If they're in a team of six people or more, the line manager gets a collective anonymous survey. And that provides, again, a stimulus to a conversation in the team about their energy and about their well-being. And again, helps the team and the line manager to talk together and to take action together to create a really healthy team. And lastly, there's been a lot of employee mental health training, um, including as we've gone through COVID, evolving new content to deal with the situation when, for example, building understanding of post-traumatic stress, of grief and bereavement, and some of the mental ill health symptoms that have been coming through in the wake of the pandemic. So this is a very live way of building a mental health campaign. And lastly, in support, We've put an employee assistance program into every country we operate. We operate in over 108 countries. I have to say, I was really, really grateful that we'd done that before the pandemic hit, because it meant we had a safety net in place. Um, the mental health champions, of course, also have a really key role in supporting people when they struggle. And I've talked a bit about the bereavement and post-traumatic stress disorder support we've been putting in place. And we also have a global hub with contacts and resources in. So we think of constantly about those four boxes. Now, as Rob said, we've also thought through, as we started this process, the order in which you do things. I think it's really, really important before we start to ask people to feel safe, to share where their mental health situation with a line manager, that there is support in place for them so that we can actually signpost people to help. I think otherwise, that's probably not a responsible thing to do. I think you also have to try and make sure that your line managers or your HR contact points are also trained and ready. So there is an order, I think, in which to start to do things, to start to build leadership support at the top level, um, and then start to train line managers in what, they, uh, in, in what they need to be aware of, to put the support in place um, for people to refer to, um, and then to start to communicate about the culture change. And then you can build from there. So it's one other thing I wanted to say. Sometimes, and I suppose it's inevitable when kind of large companies like Unilever come and talk, it's possible to think, well, if you haven't got lots of resources and lots of money, you can't do this. And I just want to challenge that a little bit. It is amazing how much you can do with very little. What are the way, best ways of doing a lot with a little? Well, first off, going to find free access resources uh, in the country or in the language that you can use. So for example, I'm based in the UK. The UK is very lucky to have the Mental Health at Work website, which is curated by Mind, which is a nationally renowned charity, but on behalf of many other mental health charities as well, organizations have been donating their content to that website. So it's possible to get an amazing amount of curated free resource. Those kind of resource centers exist in different places around the world. That's an asset to definitely go hunting for. Curated by people you respect and people who've got good reputation and free to use. So that's the first thing, there are free to use resources. Second thing, some of the moments you can create don't have to cost a lot of money. A lot of countries, not all sadly, have public mental health services that you can um, signpost people to. You don't have to pay for an EAP yourself necessarily. So there are a number of things you can do to get started, which don't have to cost a lot of money and creating events of people who talk about their lived experience. Again, doesn't have to cost. 
Let me talk a little bit about empowering the community. This is something that, honestly, I came to a little bit late in realizing how powerful it is. It's something we're also doing in the learning and leadership development space. Um, but I think creating wisdom, knowledge, contact points in the community that you're serving is a really, really powerful thing. So we've been training mental health champions. We piloted that approach in a few countries. We're now scaling it. I've been absolutely amazed and grateful uh, at people's willingness to be trained, to go through that training. We now have um, almost 2,000 uh, mental health champions um, you know, trained and ready across uh, many different countries and cultures. And that's a really important thing. The other thing we've been trying to do is during the course of last year, when we were tracking data on well-being um, during the, the pandemic, we also noticed that there were particular groups whose mental health was particularly challenged. Uh, and we tried to then train mental health champions in those groups, for example, amongst our younger employees um, who have particularly found this pandemic stressful and anxiety uh, creating. So um, I think that's another way you can use mental health champions. Mindfulness Champions also is, um, I think, has been a great revelation. We're currently in a, in a kind of movement to train more. Uh, we have Mindfulness Champions trained um, in many different languages across time zones who run sessions repeatedly. And it's a very powerful way, again, of giving people techniques and awareness that helps them to manage um, their mental health. This is an example I said I'd, I'd give you of a line manager check-in on well-being which um, again doesn't cost any money to do but and and even to to create to train into line managers which is very very powerful and a key part of high support is for leaders to have techniques like this the ability to very easily have start a conversation with the team about how they're doing um, and to also have um, it also gives a chance for the leader to share how they're doing and that creates a psychological safety which is hugely powerful a psychological safety which is really powerful for mental health but hugely powerful for performance for creativity and for innovation so what kinds of things have we learned from our journey so we're a big global organization um, and and many of you will be in similar but many of you may also be in different kinds of organizations but one of our lessons being in a global organization is that global enablement through a common language for well-being and for mental health and for our action plan, that really helps. Providing global tools like, for example, the uh, team energy uh, assessment, those are the things best done globally. But actually, local activation is absolutely critical. Having local leaders, general managers of our business, for example, and our HR leaders really actively leading for this is critical. Leadership buy-in is an absolute requirement to begin with. You need your senior leaders to buy in. But actually, as things go forward, you need to progress from buy-in to active engagement because that really accelerates progress. And I think, so there's a journey here. Sometimes senior leaders, I think, of businesses and organizations that I've spoken to start by accepting the need and that something has to be done. And over time, they realize the power and importance of it and they become involved. I think that's an okay journey to go on. The power of a community can propel the agenda like never before. So we, very early on in our well-being journey, we wrote a workshop called Thrive, uh, which we had, we trained internal facilitators in our community to run. That created the basis of a group of motivated well-being um, champions that we built on and built on. And then we add the mental health champions to that and our mindfulness champions. That community in the organization really takes the agenda forward and it is creative, creative of insight, creative of new ways of doing things and creative of insights from the different cultures around our business. And lastly, building psychological safety and storytelling are critical. Um, let me take those in two parts. So psych building psychological safety um, is, I think, fundamental to what organizations need to do right now. I think this comes through in all the work on leadership, on innovation, on creativity, on agile, on um, and of course on mental health. And thinking through how you're going to have a strategy for building psychological safety in the organization is key. And joining up with all the other people that can help. So working with different groups across the organization on some of these key enablers like psychological safety. The number of times I sit in a meeting or a conference 
uh, a leadership development session, I tell my story and somebody, usually a man, follows me out and says, can I just talk to you? Storytelling is massively powerful. We've done a lot of it. You have to do it well and you have to do it responsibly. You've got to support the people telling their story because it isn't easy. Um, it does take courage um, and it is uncomfortable, um, but it is also very powerful. So um, I'm going to stop at that point. Um, I would just leave you with a final thought. Um, as I said earlier, COVID is a huge challenge on the world's mental health. It is bringing an epidemic of poor mental health alongside and in its wake. It also provides a critical, critical moment um, on mental health. If, as we manage moving in and out of workplaces, supporting people who remain in workplaces, if we can use that as a moment to make it okay to talk about mental health and for leaders to be equipped to have that conversation, we can unstigmatize mental health for a generation to come. If we get that wrong, if we don't meet that moment and people feel they can't share the mental health implications of what's happening to them, we will stigmatize mental health for a generation. So I'm so encouraged that we're on this call together, having this conversation. Uh, we're really committed to the Global Business Coalition for Better Workplace Mental Health, uh, and I will leave it there. <laughs>